So this module deals with the cytoskeleton, and what you are now looking at is a cell that has been stained with Kumasi blue. It's a fibroblast from skin. Kumasi blue is a general stain for proteins. You may have already been familiar with electrophoretic gels of proteins that have been stained with Kumasi blue. Well, here the whole cell can pick up Kumasi blue wherever there's protein. And in this case, what you're looking at is a meshwork of insoluble cytoskeletal rods and filaments that are picking up the stain. And what you see is a network of fibers giving you the impression that the cell is not just a bag of liquid, but is actually a meshwork. Think of them as intracellular bones. That's why we call it a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton gives cells shape and also allows cells themselves to move or components within cells, organelles, vesicles, and the like, to move as well. And we'll see specific examples of all of this shortly. Let's look at the structure, the polarity, and the assembly of cytoskeletal elements. Here we have microtubules. Microtubules are built from tubulin monomers, and we see here uh, that one of the monomers, the beta tubulin monomer, actually binds GTP. That's the red circle, the red ball, if you will. So a heterodimer forms when an alpha and a GTP bound beta come together. And microtubules are formed by the aggregation of these heterodimers containing GTP, at least to start with. Microtubules have a polarity, a plus end and a minus end. The plus end is the end at which the heterodimers come together to make a microtubule, and the minus end is where the microtubule might come apart, where the, where the heterodimers come off the microtubule. You'll notice that there's a difference in color uh, between the heterodimers that are adding to the microtubule and those that are coming off. That's because soon after you establish several rows of these heterodimers in a microtubule, the GTP is hydrolyzed, and so in fact most of the length of the microtubule consists of alpha GDP beta tubulin heterodimers. I don't have very many of them showing here, but by far the longest component of a microtubule is bound with GDP, not GTP. Here is an electron micrograph of a microtubule, and when you take the measurements, the diameter of this cylinder of this tubule is 25 nanometers, making it the largest of the three principal cytoskeletal component. Now we're going to be talking about stable and unstable microtubules, and we need to just say here, if microtubules in a structure are stable, they grow to a certain length and then they stay at that length, and their minus end is basically inactive. There's no disassembly going on. But we'll also see examples of dynamic microtubules, which first perhaps form by growing faster than they come apart, but then later the process reverses itself and they come apart faster than they form. That's a, an example of a dynamic microtubule and we're going to see that uh, soon. Microfilaments are composed of actin monomers called G-actin, meaning globular actin. Remember that polypeptides can be globular or fibrous. Well, G-actin is globular actin. These are the monomers. They can be radioactively labeled for an experiment of the sort that I'll show you in a bit. And you can show that there's an assembly end they add at one end and they come off at the other end, much like uh, microtubules. So what is an actin filament? It's uh, called F-actin. It is actually two intertwined polymers of G-actin. They are seven nanometers in diameter. Here's an electron micrograph, a very nice one, showing this intertwined pair of F-actin polymers in a kind of a helical configuration. And the diameter of that pair of polymers is 7 nanometers, and that's the narrowest or smallest diameter structure in the cytoskeleton. Uh, I won't have time to explain more about the pulse chase experiment with microfilaments, but I will do so for microtubules. Finally, the third major component of the cytoskeleton are intermediate filaments, and they are simply formed from monomers that are pretty well extended. They're not globular. They have mostly secondary structure, these polypeptides, and they come together first to form dimers, and the dimers come together to form tetramers, and then the tetramers we assemble into somewhat larger structures of about 10 nanometers in diameter, making them intermediate between 25 and 7. And these are very strong rope-like bundles that provide a lot of strength to cells, and, and we've already seen some of that, and we'll see it a bit more. Here's an electron micrograph of intermediate filament, or bundles of intermediate filaments at 10 nanometers in diameter. We can localize these three major kinds of filaments, and you will see that they are localized differently in cells. So let's look at microtubules. 
in all four of these cells, if you look closely, you will see that the microtubules, the almost not visible, but the yellow structures, seem to emanate from something around the nucleus or at the nucleus. And that is very small, but it's the pair of centrioles ca that characterize animal cells. And the microtubules, you may remember, centrioles are made up of microtubules. So that they are the focal point for assembling microtubules in, in animal cells. And so you see that in two out of the three cases, very clearly, the microtubules are radiating out from the centriole. They do so in the neuron as well, but in the neuron, it's a special case where microtubules also lie parallel to the long axis of axons in neurons. In pigment cells and in neurons, you have a very dramatic example of the role of microtubules in moving vesicles around. And you'll see in a little bit that motor proteins use microtubules as tracks, and they essentially walk along these tracks, and they can carry different vesicles. In the case of a pigment cell in the skin of a chameleon, when the chameleon darkens because it's against a dark background, pigments that are otherwise concentrated in the middle of the cell move out and spread and darken the cell, and that's how a chameleon can change color. It responds neurally, and the pigment cells then move their vesicles containing melanin and other pigments outward in this fashion so that the pigments radiate throughout the cell and darken the cell. In the case of the neuron, the vesicles that are moving from the cell body at the upper left down to the nerve ending at the lower right are, of course, the vesicles containing neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are then synthesized in the cell body and conveyed along microtubule tracts by motor proteins to the nerve ending where they're going to sit around and wait for a nerve impulse to cause the vesicles to fuse with the nerve ending and release their neurotransmitter to affect either another nerve or a muscle cell. Uh, here is an, a fluorescent electron micrograph in which fluorescent antibodies to microtubules are added to a cell, and actually a living cell, where it actually picks up the location of the microtubule. Uh, the location in the cartoon is in fact taken from images like this. This is a partial picture, so it's not really showing that the highest concentration of microtubules or fluorescence in this case, is at a single point around the nucleus, which is down at the lower right of the picture. And that single point is actually the centriole. Here are cells showing where the microfilaments are. Here's our epithelial cell, for example. Uh, in the columnar cell, the microfilaments are organized roughly around the cell in what's called the cell cortex, which is the cytoplasm immediately below the cell membrane. If this is a cell lining your small in intestine, then the structure you're looking at at the top of the cell, of course, are microvilli, and the actin filaments not only are in the cortex of the cell as a whole, but also penetrate the microvilli. Here's our neuron again. The shape of the cell, uh, especially the, the structure of the axon, is in part due to the alignment of actin filaments also along the long axis. But this doesn't seem to be involved too much in mobility of, of vesicles. That's a function of the microtubules. Uh, to the right of the neuron are an attached and an unattached fibroblast. Now, microfilaments have a very different organization depending on whether the cell is attached to a surface called a substratum or whether the cell is suspended in medium. An unattached fibroblast takes on roughly an oval or spherical shape. And like the columnar cell, the actin is organized largely in the cortex just under the cell membrane to form a cortical ring of actin filaments or microfilaments which allow the cell to have this sort of rounded shape. When a cell like this attaches to a surface, however, one of the first things it's going to start to do is flatten out and then start to move. That will require a reorganization of the microfilaments, and that's what you see looking so different in the attached fibroblast. In the picture, by the way, of the microtubules, I neglected to point out that whether a fibroblast, for example, is attached or unattached, the distribution of microtubules is going to be pretty much the same. So it's the microfilaments that rearrange and allow cells uh, to change shape readily when they are attached versus when they're unattached. And here is a fluorescence micrograph using fluorescent antibodies against actin and localizing then actin bundles in cells. Look at the attached fibroblast in the cartoon and look at the fluorescence micrograph, and you get a sense of these crisscrossing fibers that look like they are penetrating the processes that this cell is extending. Those are the pointy parts, right? The pointy parts, the processes being extended by the cell. You see that in the picture as well as in the cartoon. Finally, intermediate filaments. Uh, we've already seen that intermediate filaments are often associated with cell junctions, making the junctions very tight and firm. This would be, for example, a, a, either a spot 
desmosome or a belt desmosome that we described in another module. And so intermediate filaments have a function in strengthening cell attachments. Uh, intermediate filaments are found throughout a neuron, but also along the long axis of the axon, conferring stability to this long, extended shape of the axon. And here we have a fibroblast, which is basically a meshwork of intermediate filaments that surround the nucleus and then penetrate all over the cell in all directions. And that's indeed what you see if you use fluorescent antibodies to intermediate filament to localize them, to localize the intermediate filament in the cell. Let's take a look at a single microtubule. You'll see that there are two different colors here because the cartoon of a microtubule on the left that is blue, it comes from a different textbook. I wanted to show you how microtubules assemble. The alpha-beta heterodimers will add to each other to form a flat sheet of microtubules called a protofilament. When it gets long enough and wide enough, that sheet will curl, and that's what you're seeing here looking at the blue uh, microtubule image. Or, and eventually a seam will form, and you will get an actual tubule, and that's now shown on the right. And the alpha-beta heterodimers that aggregate to form the protofilament continue to add to a fully formed microtubule, and they add, of course, to the plus end to grow the microtubule. If you look in cross-section at a microtubule, and that's shown in the cartoon as uh, item B, but also shown as an electron micrograph as item D, you can count 13 tubulin subunits in that cross-section. And indeed, all microtubules in eukaryotes are a ring of 13 tubulin subunits. And again, you see this longitudinal section that's also going to be 25 nanometers in diameter. So here we see the alpha-beta heterodimers continuing to add, even after the the microtubule has fully formed by, the, by forming a seam in a curling protofilament. Even after that, the microtubule can continue to grow longer by the addition of more alpha-beta subunits. Remember that these alpha-beta subunits are adding as alpha-GTP beta subunits, and you'll see in a moment in another image that this growth by addition to the plus end eventually results in GTP hydrolysis. So let's take a look. Here we have an experiment in which the alpha-beta tubulins were made radioactive. That's the black and white balls to just simply indicate radioactive alpha-GTP-bound beta-tubulin heterodimers. Uh, you see in this partially formed microtubule the alpha-GTP beta-tubulin heterodimers that are already there and therefore not radioactive. And behind them you see the alpha-GDP subunit bound to beta to make the heterodimer that has been part of the microtubule for a period of time. So the experiment then is to add radioactive alpha-beta heterodimers bound to GTP. Uh, that should be a black ball, not a red ball in that uh, sentence up there. And to add them to isolated microtubules for a very, very short time. After that short pulse of labeling, allowing the microtubule to grow a little bit with using some of the radioactive heterodimers, the sample is centrifuged, the microtubules are brought down to the bottom of the tube, and the supernatant is thrown away, meaning you're throwing away any remaining radioactive alpha-beta heterodimers. And to the sedimented microtubules, to the pellet, you add fresh solution containing non-radioactive alpha-beta heterodimers. And during the time that the non-radioactive heterodimers are present, that's called the chase, the microtubule will continue to grow. But now when they grow during the chase period, they are not adding radioactive heterodimers, they're adding non-radioactive heterodimers. If you sample some of the microtubules at different times of the chase, you can make autoradiographs, and you would be able to see a set of autoradiographs like those represented here. Right after the pulse, you might see microtubules with radioactivity, that is dark silver grains on the autoradiograph, at one end of the microtubule. And most of the microtubules will be labeled at an end. We'll talk about what that means in a second. If you uh, take some of the microtubules out a little later during the chase period, and that would be the second uh, illustration, the second autoradiograph from the top, you would find that the silver grains are now no longer at the very end of the microtubule, but are somewhere within the microtubule. If you wait a little longer, you will find that most of the microtubules that you can sample by autoradiography like this might show radioactivity somewhere near the center of the microtubule. And if you wait still longer during the chase, you will find that the radioactivity is now once again 
near an end of the microtubule. If you think about that for a little while, uh, remember that what you're looking at is many autographs of microtubules at each of the different times during the chase. So what this is interpreted to mean is shown in the cartoon. The alpha, beta, heterodimers are going to be adding to one end and coming off the other. So let's see what happens. We have the assembly end shown here, the plus end. We have the radioactive heterodimers with the black balls now adding. And if you follow them, we interpret the autoradiographs with this cartoon. If you wait long enough after the chase, you will find that the microtubules are no longer radioactive at all. And they don't become radioactive again because what's coming off at the minus end, at the disassembly end, might be radioactive, but they are GDP bound, and GDP bound heterodimers cannot participate in adding to the plus end. Microtubule based motility is predicated on molecular motors that I mentioned earlier that walk along microtubules, and in some cases, is predicated on the very dynamic nature of microtubules, in fact, their instability. And we're going to look at examples. Let's talk first about motor proteins. Motor proteins are going to require free energy, so they're all, in fact, ATP fueled. This is an example of a protein that has been studied. It has multiple domains, and it's made up of several polypeptides. This is dynein, and we'll see that dynein functions, for example, in cilia and flagella of eukaryotic cells, but it also functions as a molecular motor carrying vesicles in a neuron. And we'll see that in more detail in just a bit. So I said molecular motor typically move vesicles. Here we have the interior of a cell that has been dually immunostained, that is, there are two fluorescent antibody preparations, one against lysosomal proteins and another prep that's a different color fluorescence against microtubules. And what you should see here is the green is a fluorescent antibody against lysosomal proteins. So wherever you see green, that's one or more lysosome. And you can see that wherever you see green, they are associated with, attached to the red stuff, which is the microtubules you do not see lysosomes sitting out in the middle of the black spaces because they are not really free in the cytoplasm of the cell. They are attached to microtubules. As a part of the cytoskeleton, microtubules, and you'll also see this is true of actin and intermediate filaments, not only give a cell shape, but they function as a kind of a scaffold on which various cellular structures and organelles are hung. Dyne is one of uh, these motor proteins. Kinesin is another, and we know that one of the key differences between dynein and kinesin are that they carry vesicles in opposite directions. This is useful, by the way, in a nerve cell because if you want to carry neurotransmitters from the cell body to the nerve terminus, use kinesin because it's going to carry vesicles to the plus end of these microtubules at the nerve ending. And if you have to carry empty vesicles back in order to pick up more neurotransmitter than the motor protein that's used is dynein. There are other proteins that are associated with these complexes as well. But the main take-home message here is that dynein carries vessels back to the cell body where they can be recycled or refilled with a neurotransmitter. And kinesin carries the neurotransmitter-filled vesicle in the other direction to the axon terminus or the nerve terminus. Now what's shown here for a nerve cell is also true of other cells. Uh, in the case, for example, of a pigment cell, the pigments will be carried by dynein in one direction and kinesin in the other, depending on uh, whether the cell has to uh, darken or lighten. Dynein is also attached to microtubules in cilia and flagella and also in spindle fibers of mitosing cells where they allow one microtubule or one microtubule complex to walk along, if you will, slide along the other. So this now is a cross-section of a cilium or a flagellum. It can be either one because, in fact, in eukaryotes, cilia and flagella show the same cross-sectional structure of microtubules. Here is our cross-section of a single microtubule, remember, with its 13 tubulin monomers as an inset showing that in the cross-section of a cilium or flagellum, there are many microtubules, one of which is just highlighted here. Now, taking a cartoon from your textbook, uh, which is essentially a cartoon of what we just saw in, in the high-resolution electron microscope. And this structure has many parts. Let's go back one. So I want to show you that there are doublet microtubules. And if you count them, there are nine of them in the circumference of this cilium or flagellum. There are two single microtubules in the middle. And then there's all this fuzzy stuff, these fuzzy things. 
have different structures, and I can illustrate them better uh, looking at the cartoon. So here are all the parts that we would recognize. The doublet microtubules are connected to one another by these blue structures called nexin. The doublets also have motor proteins, dynene, in fact, two dynene molecules on each of the doublets. We talk about an outer and an inner dynene arm. These are the motor proteins that can extend from one doublet to the next, allowing one doublet to move along the other. And again, we're going to see that in more detail in the context of an experiment that led us to a sliding microtubule model for the bending of a cilium or a flagellum. So it's the dynene arms, outer and inner, that are going to allow cilia or flagella to bend. There are other structures here that you can see uh, on your own when you look at the electron micrograph. It looks like each doublet is uh, at the end of a radial spoke that is projecting from the center of the cilium or the flagellum. Surrounding the central pair of microtubules or single microtubules is a gray substance which is sometimes called the central or inner sheath. And this entire structure, as you can see, is also surrounded by the plasma membrane. So a cilium or a flagellum is actually an extension of the cell, complete with a membrane, surrounding this complex-looking structure, uh, which, by the way, is called 9 plus 2, meaning 9 double microtubules plus 2 single ones. The 9 plus 2 microtubule array, characteristic of eukaryotic cilia and flagella. Well, you can dissect a cilium or a flagellum and analyze the structures inside. So here we have a sperm with various parts shown, but we're going to concentrate on the flagellum, which you can actually pop off the sperm uh, using a high-speed blender. Now what you have is a membrane-bound 9 plus 2 array of microtubules, and this isolated flagellum will actually beat, just like a real flagellum, if you add ATP. So it is a kind of model for the intact sperm in terms of the movement of the sperm tail, right? Now, if you treat with some detergents that will disrupt the phospholipids of the membrane, you can actually strip the membrane off. If you want to uh, then centrifuge, you can collect the structures that you have left behind, the axonine, which is going to move to the pellet, and then you can throw away the supernatant, which has all the, the uh, phospholipids and other membrane components. And then you can resuspend this structure called the axoneme, and look at it in the electron microscope. The axoneme is the, the inner microtubular component of a flagellum or a cilium. Now if you add ATP, it is hydrolyzed, and the free energy does in fact uh, enable this axoneme to beat. Now without the membrane, that beat is a little jerky and, and not, not quite as smooth as it would be in flagellum itself, but it definitely is whipping around. Now, you can use different detergents and different chemical treatments to break the axoneme apart or to remove components of the axoneme. And you can do this, right, you will actually separate the microtubules in the axoneme into single and double microtubules or doublet <laughs> microtubules. So here we have axoneme and an appropriate detergent and we've broken it apart. And what do you see here? You see the single microtubule that would have been derived from the middle component of an axoneme. And you see the doublets. And illustrated on these doublets are these are the dynene arms as well. If you dialyze this preparation to remove the t detergents and chemicals which had disrupted the microtubule structure of the axoneme, the microtubules will re-aggregate, not into an axoneme, but into a sheet of doublet shown here. The uh, single microtubules don't have the capacity to associate with one another because they have nothing that allows them to bind. On the other hand, the doublets with their dynene arms, which would account for sliding of one doublet against another, would have to bind the, the doublets to one another at least at some point. So you can explain the production of this sheet if you, by removing the detergent. Now, if you add ATP to this stuff, they come apart again. Let's take a look at how they come apart. We know that they come apart because when you add ATP, the ATP will be hydrolyzed, and the microtubule doublet will actually slide past one another, like this. And I'll show you that again. They slide past one another, and they come apart. How do we know this? If we added just added ATP, we would watch it get hydrolyzed, and a couple of seconds later, we'd look in the electron microscope, and we would see all these individual doublets, and we would say, oh, we added ATP, the microtubule doublet sheet comes apart. But it comes apart by sliding, and we know that, 
Uh, there are actually electron microscope pictures, which I wasn't able to find in time for this presentation, but I'm showing you a cartoon that is very much what the electron micrograph would show. Add ATP, and if you stop the action almost as soon as you add the ATP, you can actually see microtubules that have walked along one another but have not yet dissociated. And so you can imagine that if you allowed that to continue, the microtubules that are walking along one another would reach the end of the microtubule that they're walking on and would fall off. And so you would get this uh, tube full of dissociated individual doublet. But you can actually see in the electron microscope a partially disassembled or dissociated sheet of microtubules that you formed in the way I described if you stop the action almost immediately after you add the ATP. This is what led to the sliding microtubule mechanism to explain how microtubules enable cilia or flagella to move. So here we have just a pair of doublets with the dynein arms linking them. And if you just imagine one of the doublets moving along the other, movement is restricted, for example, by linking proteins. If the microtubule on the right is extended upwards, the effect will be to bend the entire structure. And now you just have to imagine that in the 9 plus 2 array, of microtubules in cilia and flagella, that the beat of a cilium or of a flagellum is going to be based on alternately walking a microtubule on one side of the 9 plus 2 or walking of microtubules on the other side. Now, the question at the bottom is something for you to think about. We use detergents at various steps. In one case, we use detergents to strip the cell membrane off of the flagellum or the cilium and reveal the axonym. So that axoneme is a basic a, uh, a flagellum without a membrane. We then use chemical treatments to cause the axoneme microtubules to come apart. So the real question is, we have introduced some new components here. What do you think some of these detergents are doing to the axoneme? And you can think about that. You may remember that E. coli bacteria and many other bacteria also have flagella, but these flagella are not at all related even evolutionarily to those of eukaryotes. The flagellum of, say, E. coli is a single kind of protein called flagellin. It's not an array of them. It's just a bundle of these proteins attached to the surface of the cell, in fact, to a little motor. And the motor is powered by a proton pump. So here we have a proton pump in the membrane. We have a concentration gradient of protons that can be relieved, and as the protons at high concentration outside the cell are allowed back in, the motor is fueled, and the flagellin structure twirls around back and forth. So it doesn't actually have a beat. It just, it, it's more like a propeller turning around rather than something that can bend and unbend. Okay, I said that microtubules can be stable or unstable. The axoneme of a cilium or flagellum is a stable structure. What that means is that during the formation of a cilium or flagellum, the alpha-beta heterodimers build a microtubule by adding first to a protofilament and then to a microtubule, and they grow until they're the right length for a flagellum or they're the right length for a cilium, and then they stop. At that point, for as long as the cell is active and healthy, these 9 plus 2 arrays, for example, are stable. They don't dissemble and disassemble. And we've just seen that the sliding of these stable microtubules accounts for bending of a cilium or a flagellum in a eukaryotic cell. There are other kinds of motility, for example, the movement of, mito of um, chromosomes during mitosis that involve a dynamic microtubule uh, that, in fact, involve assembly and disassembly cycle. So let's take a look at the dynamic mitotic spindle. You should recall that the spindle apparatus is actually made up largely of microtubules. If you look in this cartoon, you will see that there are uh, microtubules that extend from the centrioles of this animal cell towards the metaphase plate. You may remember that's the uh, place around the equator of the cell where chromosomes line up just before the duplicated chromosomes are pulled apart. And the blue and black and pink structures are these paired chromatids, which are duplicates of, of chromosomes that have formed. And we're going to pull those chromatids apart to opposite poles of the cell where we will now call them chromosomes. So there are two kinds of microtubules in this structure. There are microtubules that are attached to the centromeres of the chromosomes. These are terminology you should look up again if you don't remember. They are attached to the centromeres via proteins that assemble at the centromeres called a kinetochore. Again, we'll look at that in detail later, but I'm bringing those terms up to you now so you can 
look them up in the textbook if you need to. The kinetochore is where the microtubules attach to the centromeres of chromosomes. There are also microtubules that don't attach to any chromosomes or chromosomal material, but instead uh, attach to each other. So we refer to the polar microtubules as those which are extending from the poles of the cell towards each other and do not contact chromosomes, but rather contact each other. They have dynein arms or dynein motors. Those motors will function to push microtubules apart, which will cause the poles of the cell to separate, in effect causing what is otherwise a round cell to become stretched and ovoid and then eventually, of course, to separate entirely. The kinetochore microtubules are those which are actually attached to a kinetochore at the centromere of uh, chromosomes. The plus end of microtubules in a mitotic spindle are at the kinetochore. That means that's the site of spindle microtubule assembly, right? Because that's where the alpha, beta, tubulin heterodimers are going to add. So that means the opposite end at the centriole, it's counterintuitive, but the opposite end of the, at the centriole is the site of disassembly. And in fact, the disassembly of the microtubules at the minus end, at the centriolar end, pulls the chromosomes or chromatids apart and then eventually pulls, pulls the chromosomes to opposite ends of the cell. Now we know that there is force being generated on the chromatids, which is going first of all to separate the chromatids and then eventually to pull the chromatids to opposite sides of the cell. This was a very dramatic and very clever experiment. We have a device, a micro laser beam, that is capable of being aimed at a single mitotic spindle fiber, which is really a bundle of microtubules, in this fashion. Let's go back again. We aim it, and what we're going to do is sever the bundle. We're going to break the microtubule bundle one more time, and watch what happens. It happens very fast. After the microtubule is severed, you can no longer exert force equally on both chromatids, so instead, the entire chromosome with its two chromatids are drawn to the left side of this dividing cell. One more time, and I want to show you that as that's happening, the alpha, beta, heterodimers, wrong color here, they're going to be the GDP bound ones, are actually coming apart. So the take-home message here is that microtubule disassembly at the minus end is what actually powers the movement of the chromosomes from the metaphase plate during anaphase and eventually telophase to that left and then right pole of the cell. So dynein motors separate the polar microtubules at the same time as microtubule disassembly occurs at the minus end. Let's talk briefly about two drugs. There are several drugs that can disrupt microtubule functions. Colchicine is one. Uh, adding colchicine to cells will cause microtubules to depolymerize. In other words, the microtubules will, will, in effect, dissolve, will disappear. Taxol, which is isolated from the bark of a particular tree and now can be synthesized, blocks depolymerization. It blocks the disassembly of microtubules. So ask yourself, what would happen to dividing cells that had reached metaphase if they were then exposed either to colchicine or to taxol? And that brings us to the end of this module. We focused on microtubules here. Other modules will focus on microfilaments. Intermediate filaments have been dealt with already in, in the context of cell-cell junctions and communication.